uh, the cost effective ways you know, to do business. Uh, we have so many different things going on here today. We provided a folder. The folder we gave you is full of information. Uh, there's a template, that very last bottom part of our template. If you have your secretary or administrative assistant for yourself that does a lot of mailing, that bottom template is a lifesaver for a lot of people because it tells you the difference between what classifies a letter, what classifies a flat, and what classifies a parcel. So that template's at the very bottom of your handout. It's that big cardboard thing on the bottom. But in your folders, there's a, a ton of information, so please take the time to go through them. Um, you can know, take, take it back today. You can the right-click forms are yours to keep. Um, we just want you guys to have a good time today and learn as much as you can. But take the time to network. We have so many people in this room that are from different industries <coughs> that it's just opportunity. It's opportunity. I mean, we, it, it, printers, shippers, uh, real estate agents, um, you name it. We have pretty much anybody in this room that, that would be a great networking opportunity. So please enjoy yourselves today, and if there's anything we can do, we'll be around the room. You can just ask any of us, well, we're here to help. There's the other uh, definite benefit of the PCC is the networking with the Postal Service itself. There's a wealth of information in this room, as, as uh, Bernadette said, both with industry and postal. So uh, the more, more you can network, and speak with people, you never know how they might be able to help you um, or assist you in, in the future, whether you have a question or concern, chances are there's somebody in this room who's dealt with it in the past. Um, one thing in your folder, if everybody could, before they leave today, take a moment, there's a survey. It is in the left-hand side of the folder, the front of the folder, the agenda side, all the way in the back. We really appreciate it. Um, any input you can give as far as additional topics that you'd like to hear, we greatly appreciate it. We, there's so much information out there. Um, I mean, anybody who's been to uh, the DMM or Postal Explorer, you can get overwhelmed in a heartbeat. So um, we like to know what our, our audience is looking for. So we really appreciate your feedback. Again, very grateful to have all of you here. I'm going to uh, take a moment to uh, tell you about Sharon Rogers, who is our district manager. She was named the district manager in uh, April of 2015. She's responsible for the mail processing, delivery and retail operations in southern New Jersey and Delaware. That encompasses 3.2 million postal customers, with annual delivery of 1.7 billion pieces of mail. I know to me that's a, that's a staggering number. Um, this district has over 400 facilities and more than 9,600 employees. Um, Sharon has been uh, uh, with the Postal Service for over 22 years. Um, we are happy to have her here, and it is my pleasure to introduce her at this time. Thank you for being here and for your support. You are the heart of PCC. At this time, I'd 
I do want to take a moment to recognize some of our postal professionals that are in the audience. First, let me start with my South Jersey, South Jersey uh, plant manager, senior plant manager, Jay Robinson.
to certain sports teams and equate it to the business world. And if you're a basketball fan, <laughs> you look at the success of Villanova. <laughs> Build over team is, of course, teamwork. We'll link the build over piece with our with our guests here in a minute. Watching them, you can easily see the success of teamwork at its best. Their coach talked about how easy it was to teach the team because they were humble and brought into a system. Now that is something we try to stress in a postal service. All of our managers and leaders have to rely not only on their employees but their colleagues other districts, other teammates, operations managers, to ensure your mail is moving in a timely manner. That's why you saw the representation of this area. You have South Jersey, Philadelphia, Central Pennsylvania here. Now, you're a Phillies fan. You look at spring training as a key opportunity to stress the fundamentals of the game. Especially this year, when a lot of new talent to assess and focus on. So again, applying that to the business world in South Jersey District, every post office and plant has its experienced workers and its new employees. We work hard to teach the new employees about being hopeful, proud, as they assimilate into their new positions. Now I'm gonna flow in a, some more comment here. This is a little bit different, but it, it's, it's, you know, just listen to it and kind of pull it together. So, if you don't want to admit it, I know one of you of the 101,000 fans who attended WrestleMania in Dallas, Texas <laughs> past Sunday. We all, I mean, you know, you don't, you don't have to admit you watched wrestling. <laughs> we can laugh, but we had a seven, WWE had a $17 million payday. Now, now this is for a sport that's really just entertainment. That back when we watched when we were small, we thought was real. Come on, you know you did. <laughs> we all did. Now, we all know that everyone in this room will deny watching wrestling. I know, I can hear the laughter, but for decades, it continues to be a moneymaker. The question is why? Well, they deliver an entertaining product for their customers. So, if you look at that piece, let's look at the flip side of the sports. Let's face it, when you consistently root for a team that is bad, what do you do? I would say you live in Philadelphia, that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. You know, the Eagles are coming back up, can't talk about the Sixers. Right? <laughs> can't. They just fired their GM. So, change is coming. So, first thing you do is you start talking about how bad they are, right? Then, if there's no improvement over time, the typical fan will likely cut back on the number of games they attend or when they watch. So, in the business world, isn't it the same? You try a certain store, if you're unhappy with your experience, perhaps you give them a few more tries before switching your allegiance. Now, as business men and women, I'm sure all of you can relate to the importance of providing excellent service to our customers. And we recognize the importance of doing our job successfully so that you can be successful as well. Now, as an organization, we have our challenges. As you know, the Postal Service will be forced to reduce prices for forever stamps and other milling products effective Sunday, April 10th. Now I'm gonna go and show you a little real quick slide presentation in terms of how we're preparing for that, but this is the first time in history that we're actually giving money back. And the mailers are holding mail for this week. And, we, and they told us they would, they told us before, we're going to hold for that week because prices are going to go down. Why spend the money now? So as you know, the post service will, you know, we said we're going to force reduce next to price of milling, one ounce first class mail. Letter will be 47 cents, down from 49. Letters with additional ounces will drop to 21 cents from 22. Postcards will be 34 cents from 35. And letters and postcards to international destinations will fall to $1.15 from $1.20. Price reductions are required because the Postal Regulatory Commission has ordered the U.S. Postal Service to reverse a 4.3% exigent surcharge that has been in place since January 2014. Now, with this exigent, it is expected to worsen the Postal Service financial condition. 
by reducing revenue and increasing that loss by approximately $2 billion a year. The exit surcharge granted to the Postal Service only partially alleviated our extreme multi-year revenue declines, resulting from a great recession that succeeded $7 billion in 2009-11. So our Postmaster General said last month, removing the surcharge and reducing our price is an irrational outcome considering the Postal Service prepares financial condition. So what do we do? Well, I'm a big proponent of the phrase, act locally. What we do here can't change. We have to continue to collect, transport, process, and deliver the mail in a timely manner so that we keep your business and help you grow your business. So let's, let's segue, and I'm going to show you on the screen real quickly. Go back one slide. Now, this is the Eastern area. Yeah. This is everything that comes under the responsibility of the Eastern area, uh, 10 districts. Tennessee, Kentucky, Appalachia, Philly, South Jersey, et cetera, West New York. So if you think about what Megan talked about in terms of to keep your business, well, to keep your business, we have to deliver product, we have to provide service. Service is foundation. So if you go to the next slide, I'm going to just show you a real quick slide presentation of how we're doing, and this is mail, basically that uh, standard mail, periodicals, letters, flats that you drop in post offices, here in South Jersey and throughout the eastern area. And basically, it's going to give you a real quick slideshow. There's seven areas in the country. So there's seven people like me that govern the country for operations. And I have the eastern area, we have Metro, Great Lakes, so it's all parts of the country. So quite naturally, you know, this is a, uh, a game of rankings. You know, everybody's pretty smart here. You can see you don't want to be seven. You don't want to be six. You don't want to be five. You really don't want to be four or three. You want to be in that one or two. Because if you're, if you're three, you want to push up to two, but it's, it's really delivering that expectation for the customer. This right here is standard letters. Standard letter mail that's dropped in um, all the plants in each scenario and our performance. And you see for the quarter, now that's with a, we had a uh, storm, Jonas, that came in. The goal is 91. Each scenario leaves the country 96.14, which is really four, almost four or five points higher than the, than the goal for the customer. And for the year, number one, for letters. So we're processing letters, standard letters, at a rate of almost first class scores. And we used to have first class over that. So for each scenario, number one, there are letters. Go to the next slide. This right here is our service trend, red. The, uh, the gray is last year. So you see last year we approved, and the trend is going up. Next slide. This is the flats. This is the flat mail, flat volume you give to us. Uh, not at goal for the customer, but um, 89.49 for the quarter number two, and number one for the year. So we still have a lot of work to do on the flat. We need to be at 91. That's the goal. Three scenario. This is our flat network. Better than supply, going up. But the goal is that green line that's the expectation for the customer. So we're getting there, we're getting close, but we still have a lot of variation uh, that we review every day. Next slide. This is the volume that comes to the NDCs that you drop in the NDC, which is the old BMC. And you see here, um, goal is 91. We're number two for the year. Uh, 94.14, number one is 94.30. So like I said, we're being at number one, number two. We want to push for number one. This is a, this is, showing you how we're doing processing mail through the network. Next slide. This is the NDC trend. We're about to keep going. This is NDC flats. Flats were number one in the country for the year. Number one for last week and last two weeks. So number one for this actually should be number one for the quarter. 9179, the goal is 91. So mail is dropped in the NDC and the flats, deliver the customer expectation. That's the trend. Continue to go up. This is the one that we continuously, even though we're number one, we're not where we need to be. We're at 86, 63, at 85, 95. We flatten out. This is the periodicals. This is, you know, Red Tag, Time Magazine, Sports Illustrated, ESPN, those are periodicals that you drop into our plants. This is the service for these scenarios. Even though we're number one, you see we flatten out. We haven't got up to that 91. And really, the difference of us getting up to the 91 is really within the four walls of our buildings. It's rehandling mail, reject mail, 
It's not um, about drops. It's us. If it gets out of a, uh, a flow, we don't do a good job of getting it back into the flow to expedite it. So we're looking at four or five points. Now we have districts in each scenario that make the score, but the area is at an 86. That's the trend. Now, here's the other piece here I was talking about how we're holding back volume. This right here is the on-hand volume trend uh, for the last you know, few weeks. So if you see here, volume, recent volume trend, we were going up. And we were running about 105 million, 96, 106, 109. Then all of a sudden, it dropped to 97 million. That's the week, that's last week. That's showing you the, the volume that's being held before the exit and rate case, which is what we expect. So just to give you perspective now, we're getting ready. Um, and we probably will see a little bump next Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for that week. But what we're doing in these scenarios, we're driving the mail ahead of the color. We're just processing it to capacity so that when quad graphics, R Donnelly, or all these mailers drop mail on Monday, we are ahead of the color. Okay. And that's, each, that's the one hand volume compared to same period last year. So if you see the one hand, we're under same period last year. So that tells you that now we're our one hand volume. If it was that supply, it would be the same situation last year. You can see the last four weeks, the volume is, the gap has gotten wider. Like look at the gap in the beginning from week 15 was tighter, tighter range, but it's gotten much wider in the last four or five weeks because that's that mail that's kind of been with exit rate case piece, uh, mails are adjusted. Okay, so I wanted to just give you that piece when I said that we have to continue to collect, transport, transport and process the mail, we have to get to get the service. That's all we can do. These issues, the exigent and PRC, that'll be handled by legislation or postmaster general. I can't control that. What we can control is our service to you. So I wanted to give you a little peek in terms of how Eastern Area is going. And if you look at all the categories, you we were number two in a couple of them. Basically, we were right there. And I'll be honest with you, I never think it's fixed. That's just how we operate. It's never fixed, which means that even if we get the customer expectation, we want to get better than customer expectation. So, so to summarize, let's get back to, to talking about. So to summarize the sports analogy that I talked about earlier, our goal is to be your great teammate, to listen to our experienced PCC members and assist the new members and to treat your business so you can be wildly successful with a record amount of customers. So when you think about, I'm very, very confident and proud of the postal team in all the three districts that are here today. Philadelphia, South Korea, South Jersey, the entire leadership. As you can see here, they support each other, they work well with each other. Many days, a lot of you don't know, you know, Philly sends me out to South Jersey with their lift issues to make certain we get the capacity. So it's all one campus and one team down here. They all work together to ensure that the customer expectation is met when we have those challenging days uh, that we have, sometimes do have. So now let me get to Jim Cochran, okay, special guest here. Jim is a, uh, Jim is a unique individual, okay? He's got the record for having more officer positions than I can count. He's been in many jobs, five or six, six Jim? Six. Yeah, he, I mean six, and Jim's got over 40 years of service. You know, he's a, uh, and you know, one thing about Jim, I'm gonna tell you is I'm gonna read this in your personal story. Jim is very, he's a, he's a man of the customer, man of the people. Because he's down to earth, he's gonna tell you, he's not afraid to say, here's what it is, here's what we need to do. And it's good to have somebody on the, the ELT that has that kind of voice. Now, you know, Jim grew up in Jersey, specifically Jersey City, where source of state started not only on the Red Island of St. Peter's Prep, but also in basketball. Jim is tall, you see, he stands up, he's a tall guy. You know, he looks down on me, he looks down a lot of me. Okay. We also learned he's a big Villanova basketball fan, Jim went to Villanova. Yeah, that's right. Now, you know, I can't help that he's a Mets and a Jets fan. But that's that New York, Jersey piece. So that's part of it. That's part of the culture. You know, it's part of that culture. But rumor has it he's been down in D.C. and he's found the Washington Nationals and he goes to those, those games as well. So also, uh, Jim 
he has an uh, acting career. Um, his voice, you, you got to listen to it, because it's, it's only been done a couple of, Pat Donahoe did it, when he's a postmaster general in Jim, he has a voice for the commercial. The post service commercial playing, please welcome, he's, you know, he's, that's what he's like, he, he, has a, he has a voice. Now let me give you a little background before I just say bring Jim up. Jim was named Chief Marketing Officer and Sales Officer Executive Vice President in January 2016. Like I said, Jim's been in marketing, operations, he was a DM, he's a plant manager, so Jim really is a diversified officer who can really talk the language at the table probably better than a lot of people because he know Jim never forgets the feel. That's one of the things with Jim, you go to him, he never forgets the feel. Now he does report to the Postmaster General as responsible for all domestic and international products, marketing, developing management. He is also responsible for the Postal Service's pricing, global business sales, and stamp service organizations. Prior to being named Chief Marketing Sales Officer, Cocker serves as the Chief Information Officer, Executive Vice President, where he was responsible for the integration of technology and innovation in all aspects of operations. Additionally, he directed the advancement of new mail intelligence, engineering systems, information, technology systems, payment technology, secure digital solutions, corporate information, security to meet the changing needs of today's marketplace. Throughout his 41 postal career, so I got 29, 41, so I was 11, he started with 12, going on 12, when he was working the mail. He served in a variety of roles, including Vice President of Product Information, where he held, he and his team were responsible for innovations and technology and tracking systems, including the Intelligent Mail Barcode, Intelligent Mail Package Barcode, and increased the business intelligence they provide. So Jim's team really was responsible for a lot of the technology that how we track the mail and how we got better. It's called Intelligent Mail Barcode. Without that technology, we would still be talking about how we look in terms of mail on hand and then the customers would be continuously coming into us saying, listen, my mail's been sitting for six days, and we'd be going back and forth. Now, because of this data, because of this information, we know how good or bad we are. We don't have to wait for the forum to have a conversation about service. We look at it every day. We can see it, we can feel it, we can touch it, and we can change it because of the data of the IMB is the best thing. The best tool I think would come out, that's why you've seen those scores up there. We are delivering scores of standard better than first class. He's also served as Vice President of Product Visibility and Operation Performance, Vice President of Ground Shipping, Associate Vice President of Marketing, and Strategist for the Expedited Package Service Strategic Business Unit, and Associate Vice, I told you Jim had a lot of titles, and Associate Vice President for Sales for the former Northeast region, where he was responsible for commercial sales of 12 million annually. Prior to those roles, he served 25 years in operations. 25 years. Jim doesn't forget the field, including positions district manager, customer service and sales in Washington, D.C., and senior plant manager in Northern Virginia. He's a graduate of American University. He has a master's degree in public administration from the School of Public Affairs. Please let me welcome Jim Cox. And 
we, we got to look at some videos that they're doing. It's going to be a, kind of a web-based solution, but it'll also be a, 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 an exhibit right there in, on the floor. And so Mr. Zip came up. And, and so I've been around for 40 years. I figure I know enough about the Postal Service as anyone. And Mr. Zip was not created by the Postal Service. And they actually had an ad. Mr. Zip was created by Morgan Chase. And they were, it was in the early 60s, and they were using the Mr. Zip to get people to pay their bills by check. Because no one paid bills by check in those days. You know, you had a phone bill, you went to the, you know, the phone company to pay the phone bill. And, and so they were trying to encourage people to have checking accounts. And the way to get to checking accounts was to pay bills online. And, and it was for like five years, he was the face of their advertising campaign to use checklists. And then they retired him. And then we adopted it as we brought out the zip code plan. It's your trivia fact of the day. So for what it's worth. <laughs> uh, let me uh, thank Josh for the long <laughs> intro, <laughs> kind words. And, and uh, let me just kind of shift gears a little bit today. I want to, you know, those, who was at the Postal Forum last week? Just kind of get a little judge. So we, it was last week, two weeks ago, I guess. Time flies, right? We're in the biosphere. So if you hear my voice, if you spend a week in a, in a, in a in a biosphere, it's like a glass roof place, and, and, and it's, it's like Legionnaire's disease waiting to happen. <laughs> I had theories on, on that place. I was like forcing myself to go outside, but I swear half of headquarters came home with a, some kind of flu. And uh, yeah, and my, my wife got it, and she works for the Postal Service, and she gave it to me, so you know, if I'm <clears throat> sounding like a frog a little bit, I apologize. My voice on the video, the commercial is much better. But it, the story there is it's not that I am a professional voice actor. Or anything like that. Matter of fact, I sound like an idiot. I'm, you know, to, to, but, but what happens, all the employees in all our videos, all our commercials are postal employees. I don't know if people realize that. When you see a letter carrier at a commercial, it is one of our employees. We're proud about that. So we've been shifted to, to not use any screen actors. Not that we're, you know, it's not that we're using black, not wanting to use screen actors. You know, we're using all voiceovers and stuff. Uh, for, so I think we're going to use Chew next is the moral of the story. So you'll see the commercial with Ronnie, so um, they, they asked me to do it. So I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. And, and so I, we established I'm from Jersey City. We have funny accents up there. Not that Philly does it, but we have our own, right? So I had, I, so I had to, the tagline is, your business becomes our business. If you've seen the videos, it's like a bunch of e-commerce companies on the side of the trucks and stuff. We're trying to make a, a statement that you know, if you're shipping in e-commerce, you've got to be using us because we deliver more than anyone else. But the tagline is your business becomes our business. Well, I, so I, I did it like 16 times, and it's your business becomes our business. That's how we say our in New York. Our. And then they're, I'm in a sound booth, and they're telling me. Do it again. Do it. I said, what's wrong? You're not saying ours. Of course I am. Your business becomes our business. And the same as saying our. Same as saying our. No, you're saying our. I can say the word our, but I couldn't say all. I couldn't say our in the course of a sentence. I just went right back into my Jersey City speaking, and it was our. And, and so finally they convinced me that I what they played it back to me because I wouldn't believe that I wasn't saying our. Seventeen takes later, you know, it's it's in the book. Anyway, that's a story. Two stories you got already this morning. We didn't do a slide yet. Let me, let me shift gears and talk strategic a little bit and, and just let you know what's going on in our business. And, and there are some challenges. Now, so right out of the gate, the marketing spin on what's going to happen this week, we are going to revert prices. It, forget the PRC stuff. I did this because I'm trying to run a sale. It's like Walmart. We're rolling back prices. So. <laughs> I'm going to take credit for it because I want you to mail more. So. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Uh, I mean, because, you know, fundamentally, and I, honestly, that was a nice soundbite from a lot of the people I talked to in the forum and a lot of direct mailers. It was really a big focus on direct mail. Hey, I'm going to test and I'm going to prospect. I'm not telling my CFO that they roll back prices. I'm going to spend the money. I was talking to a woman from a college, uh, runs mail operations for a major Northeast uh, college, and she said, look, I'm taking it all, and I'm going out. My job is to deliver people on campus to, to maybe come to this school, and so, the, you know, the 4% rollback, for us, hey, it's a billion dollars between now and the end of our fiscal year in September. Now, the sales team I see is here in the room, so we're not relaxing. The goals don't change. We have to, just because they roll back the prices don't mean we hit our goals. We're, we're keeping, our, our, we're very optimistic on it, that people will stay in the mail, and 
and, and use this money to do some testing and some prospecting and do different things to, uh, to grow their business. So that's what the metal is being used for, growing the business. So let me uh, kind of give you a state of the business a little bit and, and say where we are. And so the challenge is you hear a lot about legislation. So let me put a couple of myths to rest. You know, we're not going anywhere anytime soon. I spent Monday all day looking at five and ten year plans. And ten years from now, we will be a $70 billion organization. While some volumes will continue to decline, things like you know single piece, you know, people paying bills online. That's not that phenomenon isn't new, and it's not going to change. And I met with you know most of the banks in the last couple of weeks. So volume's going to continue to change. Infrastructure grows. That's one of the challenges about this. And, and the good news is the economy is coming back, and that's good for mail. Uh, the bad news of the economy coming back is it also creates housing and growth in the country, growth in possible deliveries. So. And this goes on over years, and, and last year I think we grew at about 700,000 new addresses, uh, you know, including any, any stuff that went away, some of the urban environments are shrinking. The, the challenge on growth is, in, in our historical average, going back, if I went back 10 years, we average about 2 million delivery points. Now, I used to use that as a soundbite, but 2 million delivery points about 5 years ago, it's one of yours, is the state of Ohio. So when you add two million delivery points and you don't get any, you know, we, we, did we get any letter carriers for those two million delivery? You know, so we're absorbing some pretty significant growth. And just put it in context, when you hear those numbers, because we go to 153 million doors, I'll give you the stats in a second. Is the challenge is we, we incur additional cost. We're getting less revenue as, as of this weekend. We'll take a little bit less revenue. And we've got to continue to make universal service. That's the, the challenge on this. And so it doesn't, the strategy doesn't change. Our prices are capped. That's one of the bigger issues. But I would argue the marketplace is the cap, not the regulator. The regulator's got rules that say you can't raise prices more than CPI urban. It's probably not the right indice, I'll say. But at the same time, the marketplace will hold things back. And so, I mean, on the competitive side, we don't go too crazy with pricing where we have freedom. We price according to what the market will bear, or what, where the headroom is on price. So, anyway, so year, uh, volume year to date, if I look at it, is so single piece is continuing to be down on the left side here. I'll, I'll try not to block you. So we're down on volume here. The good news is bill presentment is stabilized. This is the second year where it's been below a one percent after a multi-year run of about a three or four percent decline. Now, as I talk to the financial institution and the, the regulated industries, insurance and telecom, it's more about growth in the economy. As the economy grows, people are, are getting more credit card solicitations and getting more credit cards, maybe have multiple banks. And, and so this is stabilizing. This is good because this pays for some of the universal service needs that we talked about. Standard mail is down slightly, but it's up against a pretty <clears throat> heavy election mail spend in uh, Kill Mr. Zip. <laughs> a pretty heavy election mail uh, spin last October. Shipping's grown like a wheat. Anyone in operations there will tell you that there's more boxes than you can shake a stick at every day. And we are a pretty significant solution, and I'll talk about some of that. Um, and international has grown in volume, but it's grown in a lightweight, so the revenue on the international is, is, is down. I worked my way backwards this time. So the international revenue is down. We're getting a lot of stuff from China. And in particular, Southeast Asia and China, but a lot of small parts. So if you're ordering things online at Amazon, so some of this stuff's coming right from China. We don't set our prices there. We get criticized for this. So our <laughs> prices, that China compensates us for delivery, are negotiated by the state department. So, you know, so once again, I, I, I mean, I've had eBay sellers come to me and say, you're charging me more to get from LA to Florida than China's paying. I, I agree with you. It's irrational. It's completely irrational. So there's a UPU this year, and we're hoping that the State Department will carry our story back saying, look, we're all for global trade. But at the same time, you can't ask me to, to pay to, for a country to pay me less than I'm charging my customers in the U.S. It just doesn't make any sense. And it's wrong, frankly, I think, for as an American citizen. The shipping business is going to continue to grow. That's the Amazon. That's Sunday. That's customized. That's our network volume. Um, E-commerce would not be, we do it in the commercial, we make a stake in the ground, but I can tell you from Amazon, e-commerce would not be where it is in this country today if it wasn't for the le leveraging the network and the people in this room to do that delivery. 
So that's a, that's a good thing, though, because at the end of the day, I'm going to show you, you know, strategies become pretty simple. And, and, and Rose said it as we, as we were uh, you know, kicking off, you should use us for all, all, the, all the products, right? If you're not shipping with us, you probably should, because the most important thing is paying for the truck. Now, I'm going to get to that in a second. Let's talk about the kind of the market. Let's get strategic for a second. So with all that going on, going back to the challenges that we face, what changes for the postal service? So sitting here, and we're, you know, I'm in charge of the strategy. I'm responsible for $70 billion. Do you change all your strategies because of what's going on? knows what a klutz I am. At one point, I was going to dance with Mr. Zip or not from over. <laughs> Maybe both. You don't change the strategy. So our role is to mind the nation, enable commerce, connect communities, facilitate commerce, connect the citizens, and that doesn't change. That goes back over 240 years. It was founded, heck, right across the river in Philadelphia, right? Predates the Constitution. That's how long we've been in business. We're not going anywhere soon. Now, as, as my ex-CIO, I have to get you guys like a new computer. It's, it's imaging, right? So, we're going to drive 4 million miles today. We're going to go to you know, 153 million address points. We're going to have about 200,000 vehicles on the streets of the U.S. today, driving around and delivering things. And that's the essence of who we are. We're a delivery company. We deliver communications. We deliver messages. We deliver funds. We deliver goods more and more. And so the challenge in a simple way for the salespeople is fill the truck up. We get hung up on, you know, I talked about China. We, you know, it's not, it's not covering its cost. Don't worry, fill the truck up. We have to pay for the trip to the mail. you got to keep the mailbox relevant. And mail does that, and direct mail does that, and magazines do that. We lose money on magazines. I love magazines. We probably lose money on newspapers. Those of you that give us newspapers, I love newspapers. And I love the stuff from China, because it's what somebody ordered. They want it. So the key issue, I, don't, I have people that work on that. we got to figure out the pricing and the cost of stuff. But at the end of the day, you've got to fill the truck up. And that's, that's the key challenge that we're going for. Keep the truck relevant, keep the mailbox relevant. And leverage this footprint. Leverage retail value. What can we do with those 31,000 retail points that we have to stay open? And we've cut hours at a lot of them. I'm sure as I go down into Kentucky, we have two and four hour offices in different places. I don't know, even here in South Jersey. I tend to look at it more densely populated, but I'm sure when you get out in the Pine Barrens and stuff, you might not have an eight-hour office there, right? But but success for me is how do I fix, I've yet to have this, but success where I have a place where I want to increase the hours from two to four hours, because I have that much traffic, people coming in to return or ship or something like that. And so once again, we're delivering 40% of the world. And we have an amazing, we have an amazing footprint. And we have a lot of, talked a lot about this already, we have a digital reflection of everything that's moving, and maybe more important, we have a lot of partners. And that's the essence of what happens at a postal forum. And you're in the room. You're here because you're in the mail business, one way or another. So you're all part of this ecosystem. And the mail service providers and advertisers and publishers and software vendors and e-commerce and logistics, we're all in this together. And we're only going to win one way, together. It's got to be a collaboration. And it's a worldwide one, more and more, as I talked about China a so the challenge is delivering customer value in this digital age that we live in. The world is changing. It's these things. These things are, are a disruption, they're a problem, and they're a solution to a ton of stuff. That's, that's the challenge we face. And, and, and it's disrupting in a, in a fast pace. So when I was CIO, I spent a lot of time looking at technology, and now I'm sitting here as CMSO, and I'm still looking at technology. Because Changes in mobile payment affect mail. I mean, there's a lot of things going on. Who uses, you know, Starbucks or like Apple Pay or something like that? It's like, it's like, why we're a little shy about that? It's not. I mean, it's, I do, and I'm 60 years old. What do you think millennials do? You know, I give that away. I'm, not, I'm 50. I'm, just, I'm younger. So, but it's changing the way things are going on, and and so you got to be around that and understand it. Uber is, everyone's familiar with Uber, right? They're going to take on taxes. We've been watching that for three years because in one of their early 
position papers to get venture capital money, they talked about Uber delivery four years ago. And they're actually testing it in certain markets. So the traditional competitors to delivery aren't just UPS and FedEx, it's Uber and other companies that are stepping into the fray. But customers are looking for instant gratification, on demand, same day, next day. But at the same time, not everything has to be that way. You hear a lot of everything's got to be delivered in two hours. I'm, look, I'm, I'm an Amazon Prime customer. Amazon Prime gets me. I, you know, so I had a kind of little like point in time about a month ago. I, I, I live in Maryland, and, and I drove down to a red light, and it's a, a highway, you know, a major highway. It's a two-minute light. I know it's a two-minute light. So, you know, I put the car in neutral and, and, you know, foot on the brake, and I reached down and looked at my phone. I did it in a safe way. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I looked down and I had an email from Amazon, and I clicked on it, and it was the deal of the day, and I liked it. And I hit the button, and I, sh and I bought it, right? And then I put the phone down and put the car in drive and waited for the light change and drove away. And I'm riding up the highway, and I just kind of had this moment of, like, Excuse my language, but holy crap, I just shopped at a red light. <laughs> I mean, the world is changing. I mean, it really kind of took me like, I, I hadn't thought about that level of convenience. But that's why these things are going to be the big disruptor. They're still rolling out. And, and the whole world of apps and how you shop and how you buy things and how you interact. You know, ask your kids if they talk to someone. Yeah, yeah, I talked to them yesterday. What did they say? Well, I texted them. It's, yeah. it's like a whole new language, right? Stats. I talk about mobile. The challenge is, and, and you know, pretty pictures. I'm going to jump through this because I think we got to get to the kind of the challenge on how people are consuming information. We live in a digital world. These pictures are taking way too long to load. <laughs> payment is a big issue. Mobile payment on demand. This whole issue for us is, is AI. So who has an Amazon Echo? All right, so I'm, I'm, Amazon owes me money at this point because I'm selling these things like every day. I, I need a finder's fee. I, I swear I've sold like 50 of them. And they are a big customer of ours. And, and by the way, Watershed Moments, they're our largest customer at this point. And it's always been a male customer has been our largest customer. For the first time ever, a shipper is our largest customer. And, uh, but the Amazon Echo is like a little speaker. And it sits in your house and you talk to it. I get up in the morning and I say, uh, her name is Alexa. She's got a very soothing voice. And I say, Alexa, what's the weather today? She goes, today it's going to be 56 degrees. Alexa, how long is my commute going to be? And she gives me choices on my commute. I can be standing in the kitchen cooking and say, Alexa, put salt on the shopping list or get me dog food. And she'll give me choices of the dog food I buy on Amazon Prime. It's an Amazon device. She'll order it for me without me saying anything, but just, yeah, order it now. And she's listening all the time, which is the creepy factor. Because <laughs> <laughs> she's always listening. I, I, whatever's going on. But I can walk in and say, Alexa, what's the population of Dublin? You'd have one contest with the kids. She knows everything. It's like an encyclopedia. It's, it's, got, it's cloud based and, and it uses your Wi Fi. But it's changing the buying experience. So you can build shopping lists on it. You're on your phone when you go out. You can listen to music. And then you can just order things. And you don't have to even touch the button. I told about the convenience of touching the button and ordering while I'm driving. I can be stirring a sauce in the kitchen ordering food or ordering dog food without touching anything. That's the challenge of all this electronics and the digital age. So, so, so that gets you to, you know, the packages, it's going to be a good thing. So the internet and digital is going to be the death of the post service. It hurt us on the, on the bill, bill payment side. I, I acknowledge that. It's hurt us a little on the bill presentment side. But it's been a godsend on the package side, the e-commerce side. And it's going to continue to grow. It's not done growing. It's, it's been shifting. This is the whole entire shipping market. It's shifting more and more to ground. Amazon is changing the dynamics of shipping. Years ago, I was the box boy in the postal service, and I ran the shipping business for a lot of years. And back then, this percentage of ground was probably about 55%. Customers need to get closer to cut. It used to be a 7 to 14, then it went to a 5 to 7. Now it's at a 3 to 5, and it continues to move to the left. It's the instant gratification that was on one of the previous slides. People want it, so you've got to compete with Amazon. So ship from store. 
becomes a real phenomenon for us because that's the responsible retailers to the Amazon phenomenon. And Amazon is a pretty significant phenomenon if you're a retailer. If you're a retailer, if you're the CEO of Macy's, Target, Walmart, I don't care who you are, when you wake up in the morning, you're thinking, what is Amazon doing? Because that's how dynamic their, their growth curve is right now, and how they're changing how people shop. That's the more important issue. So there's a lot of stuff out there. The story I want to get to here is it's growing. There's a lot of packages. Industrial is shrinking a little. So the normal traffic of going, sending things into retail and stuff has gone down because people are buying more on e-commerce. So that creates a challenge for my, I didn't have a big presence there. My competitors, you guess in FedEx in particular, had a pretty large presence there. Presence there. <clears throat> the growth curve here is, it's kind of hard to see here, but this is us on the bottom. The brown is UPS and this is purple. Uh, we're blue down here. But for the last five years, we've grown market share. And, and that's pretty significant growth in volume during, the, during that period. So we're taking market share from, from mostly the guys in brown. These guys are pretty stable, but, but brown has been shrinking a little. And, and frankly, they give us a lot of packages. So this is a delivered view. But we delivered a, a billion packages this year. We're on track for a billion packages this year for UPS and FedEx. The world's changing. That's the world of cooperation, where we do have the best delivery network. Even they're recognizing that as they give us packages to deliver for them. We can do it cheaper than they can. But it's, it's not, this, it's, but they're not, they didn't stop trying to do it themselves, right? So I talk about the delivery landscape is disrupting. UPS and FedEx are right now sitting in a room trying to figure out how to take stuff back from us. They did it to survive, but they're not going to do it forever. And they're very upfront. We meet with them quarterly. They're, we're good business partners. We're competing, and we, and we partner with them. But they're trying to figure out how to do it. They have a My Choice UPS where they basically will hold the package for a day if they think they're going to have a driver go to your house the next day. And that's okay. Everyone's trying to figure this out, including Uber and Delive and Lyft and these new ones, and Amazon. And Amazon, we sit down and say, oh, we're building delivery service. We have Amazon now, two hour delivery in 24 cities. We have delivery trucks, I don't know if they're here, running around all around the Washington area, white trucks with a big Amazon swoosh on the side. And yet they tell us that we, you know, we're giving you a lot of packages, we want to give you more packages next year, and they want to sit and talk to us about five years out. That's the kind of growth curve they see themselves on. So there's no doubt in my mind we'll be delivering a billion packages at one point for these guys. The way they're growing. And the mail is also changing. So I talked about the packages changing, but mail is certainly changing. The media is changing. The way we know, right? So, so you watch most of your content. Think about how you, how you live. Do you watch TV the same way? So who's Netflix, you know, binging and Hulu and, and, and different, you know, Apple TV to watch the shows you want to watch, as opposed to watching traditional sitcoms and things of that nature. And you're riding around and you're not listening to ads on the radio because you get serious and, you know, XM run. <clears throat> Newspapers have some challenges on the ad content. There was a Rodale Press, I think it's in Pennsylvania, is that one of yours? <coughs> Just announced they're not going to sell ads in magazines anymore. They're just going to do editorial content and pass the cost of the magazine on to the consumer. They have some, some consumer-based uh, uh, titles. Those are all pretty significant shifts. Now, for us, that one, Rodale, is, it's disappointing because we get paid on weight and piece. So I'm going to get less weight, but I still got to handle the piece. That's a challenge for us. We've been watching you know, that whole phenomenon that's going on in magazines. But the real challenge here is, is Digital is now out-tracking TV. There's more money being spent on digital advertising than there is on TV. And I have the advertising for the Postal Service. And we spend about 28% of our dollars. You have to be there. You have to be in, in, in search. You have to have SEO. You have to be on social. You have to, you have, to have some banners. You've got to have some, some, some videos. That's all going on. Every, everybody's thinking about this. The ad agencies are thinking about this. Their whole world is kind of upside down. Who's a fan of Mad Men? It's not people you know, talk, sitting around drinking martinis and smoking anymore. It's kids playing ping pong, drinking Red Bull. It's shifted a lot. That's the digital ad agencies. It's different. It really has. And, and this is a challenge for us. But one of the things we're uncovering is that the combination of mail and digital is one of the best ones. This, I mean, we had a... a um, the chairman of McCann Worldwide, one of the biggest ad agencies on the planet, which is what Mad Men is based on, basically, 
stood up at our postal form and said, mail is back. Mail is, is one of the most important things you've got to have in your mix right now because it cuts through the clutter. Digital overwhelms us. I mean, you get up in the morning, what do you do? You go right to your phone half the time. Come on. And the last thing you do at night is you're checking your phone. And you're looking at your social, you're looking at Facebook, and you're looking at emails, and you're buying things. But, it's, but time becomes more precious in this digital world. And digital steals time. Every banner they make you look at, come on, those videos, you want to see an article and you got to watch a video, kind of pisses you off. Because time is becoming more precious and they're taking it away from you. And mail is still the same way. It's got that clutter. It's muscle memory. I get home today and I'm going to pull in the driveway and I'm going to go to my mailbox. I'm going to take my mail out. I'm going to walk in the house. I'm sharing personal information. I'm going to let my dogs out because otherwise they're just going to go nuts. So I have to let them out right away. And I go over to the kitchen counter and I sort through the mail. So how many people do something similar to that every day? Now you read it right then, or you read it later. And I might read it later and I put some stuff aside, the catalogs and magazines I'll put aside. But you have that mail moment. You don't engage that way. And impressions, the impression value and attribution is an important part of this. Because they're taking credit. If you look at an ad for two seconds on a website, they're taking impression value on that. Two seconds. And they say, oh, yeah, I, I drove that sale. They, they looked at my ad on, 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 a, on CBS Sports or something. And you're really absorbing that much information? I, I think I'm pretty quick on my feet, but I'm not really learning a whole lot in two seconds. So, I mean, that's the challenge that we face with mail. With mail. And getting ready for the future of mail is really how we got to kind of change this. So these are Megan's. You know, we sat down when Megan took over as our Postmaster General. So what are those four pillars? And I spent a lot of time with disruption. These guys will tell you. I stood in front of them a couple of years ago and said, how many of you are excited to deliver food any time in the next year? And there was no hands in there. I said, you full of exactly. You guys remember this? I said, you will. I said, guarantee you'll be delivering dry cleaning. And I, I didn't even imagine the depth of this. We're delivering fresh fish in Manhattan from the Fulton to restaurants, from the Fulton fish market to restaurants. I wasn't kind of thinking that way in cases of water to businesses in, in lower Manhattan. But the world's changing. And, and you know, frankly, we're not making a lot of money on that. But we're getting a lot of attention, and we're learning. We did Sunday delivery. I remember when Amazon came to us, we wanted to deliver on Sunday. And we started, this is one of the first markets we started in. And it was like, we were kind of like this in, in the postal service. Oh, that's going to be expensive. And we just built out some new technology. We had dynamic routing capabilities. So let's test this. There's only one shot at testing, and only one customer's got the critical mass to let us figure this out. It was Amazon. And we didn't make money for the first, I don't know, six months, eight months. But now we kind of turned the curve on this. But what happened along the way is Amazon had to change their world to bring us pallets on Sunday. That's how important what Sunday was. And then they decided to give us a lot more Monday to Saturday. And the, the growth curve on that has been a, a exponential. So, I mean, we will be a seven-day package delivery company. And we didn't start out thinking it would, we thought it would be like a one-off, kind of customized. But I, in my mind, priority mail needs to be delivered on Sundays as we, as we roll this thing out. But you got to get, to do that is, is the first pillar. It's a relentless focus on customers. What's changing both from a consumer and a mailer and a shipper and a receiver? And understanding that and doing a lot of research, understanding where you are against those needs is a big challenge. So as we look about the customer, we've been looking at this and saying the customer experience is, in my mind, the final frontier for the postal service. And, and so, I, you know, and it's kind of interesting. We manage it in, in, in very weird ways all around the post office. Everybody owns a piece of it. I mean, I would argue operations, you, you own delivery. You own a big chunk of the customer experience in the whole eastern area. Those are the employees that work in retail, they report to and delivery. But yet in headquarters, we think that reports to like a customer care center. We have a care center with, with phone calls and stuff like that that manages customer experience, but it's like the tail of the dog. The front end of this is operations. I have the websites. They stay. Ribs. Who loves ribs? Ribs is a fun place to navigate and try to find information. You must be the expert if you like that, because you've been looking at it for a lot, right? So, but we're going to redesign ribs. We're going to redesign search. We're going to redesign the website. Every interaction we have and every mail handler and clerk in the postal service affects customer experience. And we have to get, get better at it. It's a place, there, there are people that, I'm sorry, it's our place, but there are people that won't go in a post office. They just say, ah, dear, I'd rather go to the dentist. Ah, no, I'm not drill my teeth. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's real. We, we test it. We get the, the verbatims back from people. 
And yet we test point of service, and we do okay on the point of service surveys. But I'm telling you, don't be delusional, because there's an element of the American population that won't walk in a post office. They'd sooner, you know, go get their teeth drilled. And, and so we've got to get, get stop that. And, and it's all about attitude in retail. It's, it's, it's about how do I treat you? How do I make you feel? And, and it's because it's a world of personalization. I go with Starbucks in the morning, and there's 15 people online you know, on my way to work. But they get me. They know me. I'm, I'm, I'm standing in line, and they're waving at me already. They know what I want. And, and that's the personal experience that you come to expect. People will wait in line as long as you not. Hang in there. We're, we're, we're a little busy right now. We'll catch up. We just did that. We get more accomplished with, with customers. So this is a big issue for us. It's a big issue for mobile for, for Megan. And she's kind of taking this on as her own. She's going to fix customer experience. That's a heads up to the office people and the sales people. We all own a piece of this. The BSN people, everybody, business mail entry, you all own a big piece of this. We need to take this up a notch. And that's our commitment to you as customers that we're focusing on this. There's the experience, this whole personalized, robust marketing experience to surrounding. If you go to Amazon, it's a pretty good experience. I need to have that same experience when you interact with us. And it's whether we're doing things with the you know, digital enhancements to mail, some of the promotional issues, everybody who's using the promotions, QR codes, augmented, NFC. And those were all very powerful promotions. The next one to come is, is informed delivery. We're testing in New York and, and in uh, Northern Virginia. And uh, you'll have this as a consumer. You sign up. Every day at about 9 a.m., you'll get an image of every mail piece that's going to be in your mailbox that day with the ability to click on it and go begin the buying, learning, uh, curiosity, experience, whatever you're trying to do with that mail piece. Pay a bill. You can click on it off the mail. You have to be in the mailbox. Informed delivery, test out. It'll be one of the better apps you'll have on your phone. Where we're testing it in New York, here's what's interesting. Millennials don't like mail. Nonsense. That's why you test. So the, the perception is they do everything digital. But they love mail because, it's, because the mail they're getting is relevant to them. They're not getting spam. They're getting relevant mail and it cuts through the clutter. If I have all that clutter in mind, what, what happens if you're 25 years old? So the challenge then is, is to give them that information. The sign up for millennials uh, that we send emails out is about 40%. They're getting email. Check this response rate, those of you that are in direct marketing. We sent out 100,000 emails in the five boroughs in Southern Connecticut. We get an 18% response rate to the email, and we ended up with a sign up at about 16%, signed up to the system. 70% look at it every day. They open the app and look at their mail every day. So we know we're onto something. We've got to finish some of the development. We're going to roll this out during the course of the year. We will have an ability to serve every American with an app that shows what's in their mailbox, what packages are coming, what it'll be the actual magazine cover, it'll be the catalog cover, and if you click on it, it's the name. So our side of this is to build the consumer interface. We will get the consumers signed up at the response rates that I think we can get. As mailers, you need to give them a landing page. If you've done a QR code or anything like that, you it's the same way. It's a person, it's a pearl. You've got to set up a place where they can land and begin to communicate with you. And then when they get home, they get another shot. So it's almost a double impression value on the mail. You want to be part of that one. That's going to be kind of cool. And we got to, you know, like I talked about customer experience. Customer experience. Richard Branson says, I don't take care of my customers, I take care of my employees. It begins with the employees. If you do that, we think we can take this to the next level. So we're, we're engaging that. We're, we're focusing on the employees. Moving them, and, and, and Josh talked about the data we're using on this. We, we want to empower everyone in the postal service to solve problems, but more importantly, know more about what they're doing so they can provide a better service and become much more information driven. We, we're collecting about a billion six tracking events a day. We're using that for proactive ways to manage our business and add to customer value propositions. And we're getting postmasters more involved. I, I, I'm a I'm a, a, a member of the family in South Jersey. I actually, uh, you're, you're kind enough to rent, you know, let me use an office down in Rehoboth Beach occasionally. And I sit in the postmaster's office and I listen to the interaction outside. And first of all, let me give them major props. It is an amazing experience. And I've run districts and stuff. But I listen to how they interact with their customers. They know them all. And, there, and there's lines sometimes in there, and no one bothers because they love it. I've had people stop me and bang on the door and say, these people are amazing. I said, I'm not the postmaster. You need to know. They told me you're important. I said, I'm not important either. <laughs> <laughs> but the guy says, I come all the way down from Baltimore. I, do all my, I save all my postal business 
for the weekends when I come down. And that's a compliment to have when somebody does that. And that's what we have to take it to the next level. But I'll tell you, sales team, cold calls, kind of tough to get in on some of these things. You, if you're a postmaster and you call up a customer and, and send them an email or something, say, I want to stop by and talk to you, people like Ben don't get postmasters coming to see me. It's a powerful title. And it is a door open. And we, get, we need to leverage that more. I mean, my dream of all the data that, that we talked about that we've been providing to operations team is someday every postmaster in the country would spend Friday or one day a week out talking to customers instead of following letter carriers around. So it's just a huge opportunity. And then finally, this is, you heard us talk about Postal Proud. It's, a, it's a, an intense engagement with our employees. And using some of our senior employees to train our younger employees to what's expected of you. In a digital world, everything you do is on TV. You can't go up to a house and throw a package up on a porch. It's just not going to be accepted. You can't get into a dialogue that's not a friendly dialogue in retail because someone is standing in line filming this thing. So you have to up your game completely. And we think that we're on the right path with a really significant investment in training in our, in our managers and our employees. And you got to continue to innovate. This is all this digital stuff that's going on. So we, we talked about some of this simplification, and we talked about some, I don't know if anyone's seen the Irresistible Catalog. I should have had a bunch sent. Can I send those to you? So we have one. All right, we should share that. So we've been focusing on promotions, and we've done some work on, on something we call Irresistible, which is really some state-of-the-art printing. And a lot of this came out of some of the 3D printing technology you heard about. But the ability to print in layers creates a lot of texture and a lot of tactile. It makes mail more responsive. And of course, you have the, the, the connections, the digital connections. We really have some nice opportunities to take this to the next level. The ship from store model is one that, so I, I, I use Best Buy, and I like Best Buy. And I, but I went there on a Sunday, and I walked in there in the middle of the afternoon, and I got attacked by salespeople, because they're all probably commission based, I don't know. But I just needed to pick up a little drive. And, and so I go to check out, and I get online, and about 18 people. I got a pretty long line. Is this the checkout line? The guy turns around and goes, no, this is the ship to store line. I'm waiting 45 minutes to pick something up. The cash register over there, there's no line at the cash register. And, and we, honestly, I went back home and we called Best Buy. They're based in Minnesota. We went out and talked to them and said, that's not a good experience. We'll, we'll come by the store and pick up all those packages and we'll deliver them for you. And we're testing that right now in, in, the, in the Cat Metro area down in Atlanta. But this one is huge. We're out to over 8,000 stores right now. The biggest retailers in the U.S., big brands, Nordstrom, Abercrombie, you go down the list. The shoe companies are all using us in this ship from store model. They don't want to do this. It's against the grain. If you're a retail manager, your job is to get people in the door. And this basically keeps people from swinging the door. This is like retail 101. Those of you that ever worked in retail, right? Swing the doors. But the world's changing. So they've had to almost counter and go to this world of ship from store. So if they don't have your size and what you want, they'll ship it from another place. And the reason to do that is to get closer to the customers. Because they might have one. The best, the big ones might have five sites. Amazon's got 48 distribution sites, including one in Delaware. That's, where town is that? Uh, Middletown. It's huge. It's, it's, you know, it's acres. I, I don't know how many million square feet. Someone who, what's Tom? Tom knew the square It's like a million and a half square foot. The place is massive. I've walked around in there. I, you know, I, I, I needed like a hydration uh, break. <laughs> it's huge. But you know, customized delivery we talked about. We talked about informed delivery. Let me just spend a little moment on irresistible. Um, this is what we got to be thinking about. we got to recreate mail. And what the title of this thing is the best part. Is, think about this. When paper and pixels kind of converge, how do you bring this together? How do you make paper as relevant as digital and vice versa? How do you make them complement each other? And we've done some really neat stuff with this, and, 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 and I'm not saying we've done it. The industry is doing it. Some of the big printers are doing some amazing stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm constantly amazed sometimes at what comes in my own mailbox. And then we have informed visibility. And I talked about data, but it, I can't talk about digital without talking about data, how we use data. So when I, first, when I was CIO, I was building out our analytics strategy and some of the stuff that Josh talked about. And, and I read a few books, and there's this guy down before who wrote a couple of books on analytics and how to do them in big companies. If, if you're going down that path, if you know, find him. He's, he's excellent. But he said, if you're looking for data scientists, go to the direct mail industry. 
because they've been at it for years. <coughs> you were so way more sophisticated than other marketers because you didn't have to be sophisticated when you're doing TV. It's just mass media. But when you wanted to target people better with direct mail and buy the right list and use the right color and, and understand which fonts make people buy and if it was selling to older people, I got to use bigger fonts. And orange makes you contribute better to charities, better than green does, and all this crazy stuff. But it's the real world of direct mail. And it doesn't change. And he was challenging people to go, go watch out people do direct mail if you want to understand how to do analytics. We built probably the biggest platform. Let me just go back on that. First time it actually moved. You're getting ahead of me, I think. I don't know. Did I do that? He's helping me out. I would appreciate that. But it's, we built this amazing platform. It connects 46 different data systems. It is one of the biggest, you know, the IT people in the room. We're sitting on it, almost 40 petabytes of data right now. But we're provisioning probably about 2 billion events to customers and back to our operations people, telling our operations people what's going on, creating inventories, and at the same time telling customers where everything is. And we're taking it so you can see visibility to the DBCSs, but the next one will be, it, it, it arrived in the post office, which you get from packages. The next one after that will be depart to route. We'll scan a, a barcode on a DPS tray. And we're using geo coordinates to confirm delivery all the way to the mailbox. And when you get informed delivery, we're going to predict delivery within a two-hour period, go to market with an aim to get to one hour. So everything that's coming into your house, you will know at 9 o'clock in the morning what's going to be there and what time we're going to deliver your house. That's why the operation people are all focused on using the tools to make sure we get our pivots and everything done the right way. And it changes mail, and it opens up opportunities to engage in different ways. That's what we're trying to do. Because it's an omni world, and we want to be able to make sure that if somebody wants to surround someone with other messaging, that they're doing it based on a catalog hitting a mailbox or a mail piece hitting a mailbox. Get that right. I talked about that. And finally, the, the investment in the future. Uh, we can't talk about going four million miles every day without talking about the fact that our, we're riding around in vehicles that have antique plates on the back. <laughs> we're over 20 years old. So we're making a pretty significant capital investment in a time where we don't have a lot of money because of these challenges, these legislative challenges, these pre-funding of retiree health benefits and things of that nature. But we're making that investment because it's important. And it's a $5 billion investment. And we're making an investment in bundle and package sorting, and that's a couple of hundred million dollars because it's important. And we made an investment of almost a half a billion dollars in new devices and smart devices out on the street so we know where everyone is so we can better serve customers and understand more about that cost. Delivery is a $30 billion cost for us. So we want to drive that down. But we want to do it in such a way that we can also serve customers. And then finally, all the information I just talked about, this data system that is probably, once again, as significant as... Uh, I mean, to just give you one... one I get a... The ops people know a guy named Steve Deere who used to work for me. He's probably the smartest guy I ever met. But, but he gives me a stat. I said, how long can we turn data around? He can, Guam is, we deliver in Guam, right? So it's you know, way over there across the date line, Pago Pago and stuff. We can scan a parcel in Guam, and it goes all the way to Eden, Minnesota, and it comes back in 40 milliseconds. That's how robust the data system we had to build to do that, which is you know, like three-tenths of a second. So, um, let me stop going. Look, a brand, um, you know, I'm responsible for the brand, and a brand is us. It's created through the experiences we talked about and people who deliver on it every day. We're a delivery company. And, and then the next piece is service. And then Josh, Josh covered that, so I'm not going to talk about it. We have to continue to get better every day. We're a lean company, continuous improvement is in our DNA. We'll continue to get better, continue to refine the, the operations, and continue to provide great service and great value to customers. So that's my long-winded spiel. Uh, I don't know if I have time for questions. I'll defer to, to the team. Any, anybody have any questions or feedback you want to say that? Sure. It's informed delivery. It's really interesting. But will it a business be able to use that? To understand what's coming in? Yeah. So it's, it's a very good question because it's, it's a size and scale and who gets what mail. So, so, if you're, if, so right now it's consumers and I'll, so let me explain why. And, and if I get a business and it's an insurance business and there's eight agents sitting there 
there's mail going to all eight, and maybe they don't want to understand what the other agents are getting and stuff. So I, I can only do it on, based on delivery point validated zip. So I have a, an 11 digit zip code, and I'm taking all the data that I know that's going to that 11 digit, and that sometimes is multiple businesses or multiple clients and stuff. We're trying to work that issue because I think there's an opportunity. We're looking at some, some addendums to the identification. It's kind of like if you think like suite links for those of you that work with software. So we can get to suite numbers on some buildings. I have an 11 digit for the building and then I have suite numbers behind that. So we're, we're exploring that. It's mostly driven as a resident, a consumer play, so that businesses can talk to the consumers. So how about in the opposite way? Can business know when the customer gets there? So I am, so that's the geo coordinate. So, so let me explain how the, we, we basically are capturing you know, quite a few, we call breadcrumbs, but every minute, every one of those handheld is saying, this is where I am. You know, I'm, I'm here, I'm here. So it goes on all day, right? So geo coordinates are, are kind of interesting. In some places, and you probably all had experience. I, if, I, if I go here, if I'm in Maryland, when I pull my driveway, it says you have arrived. And when I turn on my street in Delaware, it says arrived, and I'm still six houses away. And so it's a little, a little different. So if we're going to do it on block face, so we're very accurate. We're at 99.9 some percent accurate on block face. So when I pull in your cul de sac and I deliver the six homes, and we pull out, we're going to confirm delivery on all six of those homes. And all the pieces that went in there will go back into informed visibility, will be provisioned back to whoever is the receiver that is designated in the, in the eDoc file. So if that's Ara Donnelly or Gray Hair or somebody like that, if you use one of these third parties and tell us and track my mail, they will get that information pushed to them every 15 minutes, like they do today, if they sign up for that. So we're offering 96 pushes of data a day. Uh, and so, but some, some customers only want it once a day. We gotta change that paradigm. So this is a collaboration issue. I can do all this, but if we're not gonna use the data to predict delivery so you can share it with your clients, we're losing an opportunity. And I can tell you that, you know, the, the numbers of how much people are using this information is, is still pretty low. I mean, I, in the ideal world, you get visualized. You know, I, I can tell you that one retailer, their store managers have, an, have a, get a message on their phone and it shows you the in-home in the market that they serve on a given day. It's like a catalog hit or a mail piece. They're 85% in-home, so they get a sense of what's going to happen with the doors that day. We need to do that, like, you know, in a widespread scale. Use the information to better manage the experience, keep mail relevant, it creates the value. Anything else? You've got a long day. Thank you for, uh, for my time today.
finished, we will go ahead and take a quick break. So give us some time, we'll get there. Um, and then we're gonna, when we come back from the break, we're gonna actually um, break out into our round tables. Just so you're aware when you come back, we're just gonna ask you to walk around. You can hit the tables that you like. Our business mail one-on-one -on -one will be in the back. BSN Consumer Affairs is over here. Um, business Service Network. Uh, political mail is over here. And then on this side, we have the seamless acceptance of the mailer scorecard. And we also have nonprofit mail. And we have the 2016 USPS promotion. So just so you're aware, when we come back from break, we'll have that going. Just go to the and we'll have some time to do that. Uh, so our next speaker. Our next speaker, um, David W. Bosch, was named Inspector in Charge of the Philadelphia Division of the United States Postal Inspection Service which is sometimes known as the Silent Service, in June of 2013. Uh, his role encompasses responsibility for the safety, security, and protection of the U.S. Postal Service, employees and assets, and ensuring the public's trust in the U.S. mail within the Philadelphia, Central Pennsylvania, and South Jersey districts. Um, Mr. Bosch is a Pennsylvania native and a 28-year postal veteran with 21 years as a postal inspector. His, re uh, his area of uh, responsibility and compromises 30,000 plus square miles. It consists of 26,000 USPS employees, 9,700 daily city and rural delivery routes. It contains nine large processing and distribution centers and includes the fifth largest metropolitan area in the United States. Uh, he provides oversight to the staff of 16 professional, technical, and administrative employees and 19 postal police officers and 54 postal inspectors. Uh, he reports to the Deputy Chief Inspector directly under the Chief Postal Inspector. Uh, he is also a, uh, he's not a one of a wildcat, but he is a LaSalle explorer and one of my fellow alumni. David W. Bosch, Postal Inspector. Thank you. Thank you, Bernadette. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I am very happy to be here with you. Mr. Cochran, what a dynamic speaker, huh? Yes. Yeah. Really enjoyable. Learned a lot of new things there myself. I appreciate it. Um, as Bernadette said, I'm the inspector in charge here in Philadelphia. What I wanted to do was provide you with some information about the inspection service. How many people have heard of the inspection service? Non-postal. Okay, I see one. All right, you can leave now. Um, so this will be a learning moment for everyone. Provide you with information about the inspection service what we do for the post office, and also what we do indirectly for you as customers of the post office. Okay. Uh, what I'd like to do also is provide something personal and meaningful to you today. So I'm going to kind of go into a little bit of mail fraud and discuss some of those things. So this way, you also take some things back with you that you can use to protect yourself, your family, your businesses, those close to you. So, are you guys here? Yeah. What I'd like to do initially is to play a short video for you that'll kind of start off what does what does the inspection service do? So if we can roll that. Yeah. Security. Americans expect to receive their mail safe and secure, not stolen, not tampered with, and not read. That protection is backed up by the United States Postal Inspection Service, the federal law enforcement, security, and crime prevention arm of the U.S. Postal Service. We ensure the safety, security, and integrity of the U.S. mail. All users of the mail have the right to be protected from mail theft, mail fraud, and other postal crimes. That's where postal inspectors come in. We investigate postal-related crimes, such as identity theft, mail bombs, postal robberies, and burglaries. And when the mail is used to launder drug money, 
traffic in illegal drugs and exploit children. We're on it. And now, cybercrime. Protecting postal employees in more than 30,000 postal facilities from criminal attack and the nation's mail system from criminal misuse is another part of our job. The work we do every day assures millions of customers they can depend on the security, privacy, and reliability of the U.S. mail. We add a value no other mail service can provide, and it's all included in the price of a stamp. The U.S. Postal Inspection Service, because the mail matters. So to kind of give you a snapshot of what the inspection service is and does, I wanted to kind of go off of that. The inspection service is the federal law enforcement arm of the Postal Service. We enforce over 200 federal statutes that deal directly with the mail, with the employees, and with also customers who use the mail. The um, resources and programs that we have as far as our mission, and you can read it up here, and central to our mission of the inspection service is employees, infrastructure, and customers. That's where you all come in. It's also to ensure public trust in the mail. We are actually, as evidenced by my earlier question, we are obviously the best kept secret the Postal Service has. We focus on four key areas with the Inspection Service. Those key areas are protection, prevention, enforcement, and preparation. We ensure the Postal Service brand, and we continue to support the Postal Service to be America's most trusted government agency. Over the years, the Inspection Service has evolved Initially, we were out setting up the post roads on horseback back in the day. We ensured the security of mail transported on steamboats and by railroads and horses. Inspectors were central to two um, statutes, federal statutes, the Child Protection Act of 1984, and also the Mail Fraud Protection Act of 1876, which still is in use today, protecting consumers. The Inspection Service is the oldest federal law enforcement agency in the service of the U.S. government. Our first, our first postal inspector is anyone. I'll ask the gentleman who raised his hand. Does anyone know who the first postal inspector was? Oh, excellent. Lady up here, congratulations, thank you. She said it correctly, it was Ben Franklin. So not only was he the first postmaster general, but he was also the first postal inspector. Postal Service, since its start, since its beginning, it has focused on delivery, delivery of mail to every American everywhere in the United States. The Inspection Service mission has not changed since our founding. Our founding is based on the safeguarding of the people who move the mail, as well as those customers who use the mail. We help protect the industry, and by this I mean the mailing and shipping industry. The Postal Service sits at the center of a $1 trillion business industry. It impacts or um, consumes probably or generates 8.4 million jobs. That's how many people are involved in this industry. Security for this industry Yeah, I, I'm, I realize, yeah, it kind of jumps on you, Jim, thank you. Sorry about that. Security is critical to the industry. Why is security critical? Because customers expect that their products will arrive undamaged, on time, and... You're gonna have to back it up for me. I'm sorry, it's kind of skittish. It's jumping too far ahead. There we go. Thank you, Jim. You can go to the next one. The inspection service has an expertise and techniques to secure the mail. We offer those expertise and that um, uh, techniques that we have learned in order to help you protect your employees, your business, and your operations through working with you in your mail rooms to secure what you have in your own facilities. 
you a snapshot of what the inspection service does for the Postal Service in the way of our investigative initiatives as well as our security prevention programs. And I, I, I don't expect anybody to be a speed reader in here to cover it all, but this just gives you an idea of the various programs that we do. I wanted to focus on two programs that we provide for the Postal Service where we protect employees. One of those is postal robberies, or response to postal robberies, and the second is in the world of workplace violence. Under postal robberies, and I'll ask my assistant inspector in charge, John Walker, to bring up a prop that I have, and district manager, Bowling Star, will remember this. Two years ago, we had two post offices robbed on the same day. We take that very seriously. That is the most highest priority mandate that we will work as postal inspectors because it goes right to the heart of the fact that our employees were threatened. The person came into the post office, both of them, had a 45 caliber handgun and he wanted to rob the post offices. Obviously, he hadn't seen our financial statements. <laughs> <laughs> but he was wearing a mask. I don't need a Halloween mask that you get at the Halloween party store or anything like that. Think of a mask when you go to see Mission Impossible, Hollywood style, special effects, put the mask on, put the makeup around the eyes, tape it down to your neck. That is the mask he was wearing. So I wanted to bring that in and I wanted to show that to you today because it's very interesting, very unusual. That's the mask that Robert wore when he attempted to rob two post offices. He didn't get any money from us, but he went further down the street and he robbed two banks. Now the investigation led us to put video out online, and a caller called in and said, hey, I think I know where that mask is at. And we're like, what, really? There's actually, he gave us the manufacturer of the mask. The person was up in Massachusetts, we got a hold of him. Now we're like, oh my God, how many masks could there be out there? How many masks do you think of that quality were made? Hundreds of good guess. Actually, 18. He sold 18 of them worldwide. Nine to a theme park in India. The other nine were domestic. One went to our suspect's mother's house over in Yadin, PA. Mm. Not saying they're rocket scientists. <laughs> So we ended up uh, doing an investigation, we went further on into that. That person was sentenced, I'm happy to say, as you know, back in February that person was recently sentenced to 32 years in prison. So the moral of that story is, <laughs> The other program I'd like to talk to you about today involves our efforts under safeguarding employees. As we all know, business owners in here, Employees are the greatest asset that any company has. They're also the greatest responsibility. Employees, in order to be productive, have to feel safe and secure in their work environments. As postal inspectors, we provide training to postal employees on best practices to protect themselves both on and off the job. One of the areas that we train people on is active shooter response training. We provide this training in order to pro provide to postal employees life safety tips that are able to be used in any venue. Think about it. You go to a mall, you go to a shopping center, you go to a movie theater, and you, and you guys hear it as much as I do on the news, you know what I'm talking about. Have you, do you have a plan in place to increase your chances of survival if you were involved in a situation like that? Do you have a contingency plan at work? Are you teaching your employees or your children what to do? The Postal Inspection Service provides training to the post office on how employees should respond. It's a very simple plan, and it's different variations, but it has four components to it. And I just wanted to review those with you now. The plan starts with get out, call out, hide out, and fight out. And I see heads nodding, so obviously some people have had some version of this training. But if we're talking about get out, what does that mean? It means you stop what you're doing, and you leave. Very simple. Call out. Why would you call out? Hey, I'm over here. <laughs> no, 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 no. We don't mean that. We mean you call out because you may have a, a co-worker who's wearing headphones. So you want to call them and say, hey, I hear shots. We need to get out of here. 
You want to gather people up. People are running every different which way. You want to call people. Come this way. Let's get out. Get out. Obviously, if the person is close to you, and I mean a shooter, what do you want to do? You don't call out. You have to either get out then, or you hide out. So you have to find a place where you're under a desk, you're in a closet. What do you want to do if you're inside of a room? Anyone? I would say it's Bueller. Bueller. Lock the door. Yes, lock the door. Turn out the lights. What do you do with your phone? Turn it off. Okay? And last, lastly, last resort, if it were to come to this, what would you have to do? Fight out. Fight out. So you grab anything that you can that will allow you to take an action to definitely increase your chances of survival. So that's what we teach our employees. We encourage them to take that home with them, talk to their family members, because you have to remember that when this occurs, it can happen anywhere. It's a simple plan, but under the stress of time, you want a simple plan, something you can remember. In addition to protecting and educating our employees, postal inspectors have also um, developed a method to screen and protect the postal service network. It's called our dangerous mail investigations. This also benefits you because there's equipment in the post office that is used to uh, screen the mail, but when something suspicious or um, unusual is found, and I'll just say a powder, you're all well familiar with powders, it can also be a liquid. We have specially trained inspectors who respond to a postal facility, and we have specialized equipment that can analyze the powder or the liquid and give us a fair representation that well, this is water, or that is coffee, or it's possibly sugar, or it could be sugar from donut dust, or it's um, uh, cleaning detergent. So that is a service that we also occasionally provide to you all as customers, because if you were to receive something in the mail that was leaking or had a powder or was a liquid and you were concerned about, we would encourage you to also call us, because we will respond to the facility. Why? Because you are part of our network. Where did you get that package or document from? It came through us. So obviously if you're having a concern with that, our employees process that. We have a concern with that also. In your packet, you will see this, this document here. It's up on the screen. For those who do not have this, this is what we consider to be suspicious mail. It gives you clues. It gives you things you should be concerned about. This I would put up in your mail room, share it with your employees, just so you're aware. The odds of receiving anything in the mail like that are very, very, very remote. However, if you do receive something in the mail along that magnitude, do you have a plan in place to deal with it? And we refer to this as a contingency plan. In the inspection service, we teach the post office what we call our safe and sane plan. Our safe and sane plan is the package, isolated immediately. What do we do with the people? We clear the area, and in this instance, contacting us, the plan is us, is the inspection service. This is the postal service plan. I put it up there because you should also have a plan if this were to happen in your facility something to think about. The inspection service is focused on preparing the post office for any disaster. One of our greatest assets is the fact that we are federal law enforcement officers trained to respond as first, first responders to any situation. When disasters strike, what does the post office do? We keep the mail moving. What I like to do is just play a short slide clip for you.
to share that video with you because I figure most of the people in this room have lived through Sandy. So the post office is very big. We prepare them for emergencies. We're very big on contingency planning and communication. So we learned a lot of good lessons from Sandy. And I have to ask you, and you have to reflect on this in yourself. From your own business, do you have contingency plans in place for you to deal with the disaster of that magnitude again? What did you learn from that? Have you prepared? You have to ask yourself some questions. If you were to lose the ability of all your customer database, would you be able to replace it? From a shipping standpoint, you go to a place and you drop your mail or where you normally ship at, do you have an alternative site? What is your plan? Have you made arrangements to take care of your employees? Or where is a contingency, or we call it a poop site? Do you have a poop site to recover your business activities in another location? These are things that we do for, for as the inspection service that we do for the post office. But I wanted to share that with you because you're all in businesses. And the idea is, what is your contingency plan? Back up on you. Safeguarding transportation. Obviously, as was mentioned up here by Dr. Collin and also uh, Jim, that the post office is a transportation company. We take things from A to B. That is what we do. Obviously, the inspection service plays a big part in securing the transportation. So we go out and we do a lot of security reviews. We go to train stations. We go to the airports. We review when mail is handled by contractors. To make sure that those items are safe and secure. We're looking for where mail is most vulnerable in order to better protect it. Another place that we secure the post office is, this is a little known fact, the Postal Service has the, third, the world's third largest computing network. The Postal Service has about 200 plus thousand users on our intranet. It also transacts about $340 million a year on USPS.com. It's not counting retail units. So imagine the amount of data people come, they put online with us, they also run it through a retail unit, your credit card, your debit card, it's all PII. Everybody know what PII is? Okay, PII, I got one person that said no, so I'm gonna say that. Personally identifiable information. That is the information when you go to get a credit card or you're applying for a mortgage. Think your date of birth, your social security number. That's something that identity theft uh, thieves would love to have. All that information, all that business being collected by the post office. Who secures that for the post office? The inspection service. So we aggressively investigate any type of cyber crime or cyber attack of which there are probably several thousand a day people trying to hack into our network, USPS.com, and we're responsible for that protection. Why? Just like your business, and, and Mr. Cochran mentioned it earlier, if you have bad service at a business continually, are you gonna go back to that business? If your information is compromised, are you gonna be a little leery about using that business again? I would be. Offer me all the protection you want after the fact, but spend the time up front to secure my information so it doesn't get stolen. So that, that's where we support the post office and also protect our customers. Now obviously we can't be everywhere. We only have 1,400 post inspectors in the country. What we do is we use prioritization and we look at risk. Our assets are our employees, our facilities, our infrastructure. We take an asset, we look at a threat, we look at vulnerabilities. This is also something that when you're thinking about how to protect your own businesses, what is the risk of something happening to your business, and is it worth the money to spend to mitigate the threat or the vulnerability? What we do for the post office is mitigate risk. Obviously, everything that Jim was talking about up here, going online, and you know, different methods of delivery, all those things have some degree of risk to them. We sit down with them, our inspectors at headquarters, and we assess, okay, these are the risks and then we try to look for ways to mitigate them. Because we want the business to be successful, we have to find ways to take the risk as low as possible in order to maximize profit. You can all understand that. The way we help customers, and we have done this on numerous occasions, and I offer that to everyone in here, 
just understand that it can't be the only thing that we do. Uh, we would get to you. But in your mail centers, inspectors are security experts. We would come out and do a review of your mail center security. Has anyone in the room had their mail center security reviewed by postal inspectors? Yes. She's shaking her head. She has to shake her head. <laughs> okay. I offer that too. It doesn't really matter the size of the company, but if you would like us to come out and do that, we offer um, prevention efforts. It's designed to protect your employees, and it's also designed to offer you security recommendations. Now, these are recommendations on securing your network, your mailing house, your mailing room, or whatever that may be. Since they are free, they are also non-binding, and we don't ask you to pay for them. So this is a service that we provide to you as customers of the Postal Service. And there is a little bit of self-interest involved, I will say that. Because you are involved in our network, we have interest in securing our network. So my concern is what you are putting into our network. And if we can help you in advance, mitigate risk as to what you might potentially mail or what you may receive in the mail, that only helps secure the overall postal service network. So it is a little self-interest, but you can benefit from that. Mailing industry, we support the mailing industry and we've identified various sectors and we focus on the sectors. So what we try to do is we get with the mailers and we identify best practices and then we share them among the various sectors on how they can better do things with their mail so it's more secure from fraud, theft, and diversion. The identified sectors here have uh, a best practice that we can implement, you can, we can share, we can provide to people. So I, I just say that that is out there. We spent a great deal of time working with mailings, mailers to develop these. Partnerships. Obviously, with only 1,400 <coughs> inspectors, we depend a lot on other law enforcement agencies, whether it's federal, state, or local law enforcement. We have a lot of joint task forces, whether it be with mail fraud, child exploitation, uh, identity theft task forces around the country, consumer groups. We are very heavy proponents of protection and prevention. So we interact a lot with BBB. We interact, interact a lot with AARP, and we're trying to educate people. So you'll hear me talk about that at the end of this, at the end of my talk, as far as protecting yourselves. Industry groups, we work with industry groups to develop those sector best practices. One of the best practices that we have is with Intelligence Sharing Initiative. This is an initiative where large mailers who experience losses, it could be credit card companies, it could be product shipping companies, they will send their information to a neutral party. Us, we are a neutral party. They send us their losses and where they may have fraud at an address. We then take all that information, we put it together, and then we turn it around and we share it with everybody who provides the information to us. You're saying, well, wait a minute, how does that work? We scrub all the company names from the information. So no company realizes that another company is losing money or things like that. It's very anonymous, but overall, your company can see where another company had losses, so you don't ship your products to that company if there's a problem with that address. It's an intelligence sharing network. We have a financial crimes database where we input the losses that are provided to us by customers according to credit cards that are stolen possibly and used to purchase things. Also, when items aren't received in the mail, those all lead to patterns. Obviously, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for patterns. We also have fraud and loss complaints. Securing borders. Mr. Crocker mentioned this earlier. The world is shrinking. It is global. So he's looking to go overseas, and that means so is the inspection service. As we develop and you develop businesses overseas where you have customers, you again want your products there on time, undamaged, and at a reasonable cost. So we are working with our international partners. We work with the Universal Postal Union. 
Mr. Cochran mentioned that. Remember the State Department that he talked about? There are things we have control over and things we do not have control over. But under the Universal Postal Union, which is a um, United Nations, this is under the United Nations where about 170 countries have signed on to collaboratively work with other postal administrations on how mail is transferred between countries. Also under there is a group known as the Postal Security Group. My boss, Chief Postal Inspector Guy Cottrell, as well as being the Chief Postal Inspector for our inspection service, he's the Chief Security Officer for the Post Office, and he's also the Chairman of the UPU Postal Security Group. In, under that group, we work with the other postal administrations and foreign law enforcement to address problems of shipping and losses overseas when things aren't secure. There are a number of postal inspectors, because we are under that group, we provide security consulting to the postal administrations in North and South America. So if you are in Bolivia and you're that postal administration and you need problems or you have problems with losses and you want to mitigate that, a lot of times a postal inspector or two from the United States will go there and assist on helping that foreign country. Provide just access to other law enforcement in other countries. So if you're thinking about shipping overseas and you're worried about that, talk to the salespeople, but we're very interested in the security of anything that may go overseas that you're shipping. As I mentioned earlier, protection is our goal. We realize that it is a lot easier to have people not fall for a scam than to try to arrest our way out of a problem. And I know you've heard that before, but we standing here with 21 years as a postal inspector, I know we cannot arrest our way out of a problem. I've tried. It's not going to work. They can't build a jail big enough. So, what does that leave us with? The Postal Inspection Service is in the business of protecting consumers through education. We try to raise awareness of consumer fraud and educate the public regarding current frauds and scams. The last part of what I'm going to present for you today is focused on what you can take home. Now, you know, we've talked about your business, we've talked about workplace violence, but these are some things that I want to give you information and resources that are readily at hand so you can then have a conversation with possibly your younger children or your senior parents. Anybody have senior parents that they might be a little concerned about making a bad financial move? Okay. Anybody in this room concerned about making a bad financial move? <laughs> And of course, I figure we all have children who, if your child is a teenager like mine, they know it all, or they can look it up on the internet. We all know we can trust what we find on the internet. <laughs> so, I wanted to um, play for you. This is a video that we have that we provide to the TV and journalism industry. Now, investigative journalists, a lot of them do their own stories. If you are in a smaller market, you cannot do your own story. They will buy things online, or I'm sorry, from a company called Litton. And these are what we call Consumer Alert News Network segments. So, Jim, if you can play it up. In less than one year, the Consumer Alert Network has established itself as one of the most important and final sources of information available to local television stations. Don't get duped when you're looking for a new career. A new scam is emerging. The key to avoiding it is being aware. There are hair letters going on, going out right now in the mail. Both claim that you've won big money, but the catch is you have to pay to get that money. The power of broadcast television combined with a non-traditional approach to media outreach has created a real force in reaching the American public. I got one of these phone calls, or I got a letter just like that. They want someone to hear, and they want someone to know that they did the right thing because of your report. Almost weekly, I have a bureau who contacts me by email or calls me or sees me up. 
problem with policy scores and says, that same scam happened to me. And I'm happy to share with them uh, what we have learned through our own association with Consumer Alert and the Western Inspection Service. It is unique and indelible. A Consumer Alert is reaching Americans with an important message. I've received emails from people wanting to know how they can help victims. Most recently, one of you have wanted to personally give money to Gertrude Shaw, the victim who lost thousands of dollars in sweepstakes swindle. Consumer Alert is teaching people and touching lives. Finally, I caught on and I said, this is this is too much. Just knowing that there's people in this country that are willing to say and do anything. Assume it is a scam. I told you no that. actual case that we have worked to provide a segment for the Consumer Alert News Network. That is out on major media with the television stations. Now I talked about seniors and younger people. What I'd like to do at this point is to give you the location that I feel is a trusted site for information that's reliable and also relevant. So I'll ask Jim to... Okay. USPS.com, Jim. There we go. I'm sure at some point, everyone in this room is familiar with this website. Trusting on that, I will ask how many people have actually gone to the bottom of the page? Okay, I see three, four, five hands. Okay. At the bottom of the page, you will find a link. And on that link, it says Postal Inspectors. Very small, very tiny. You click on that link and you go to our webpage. On our webpage, you will see this picture just as it appears. On the left-hand side, on the left-hand side, right here, the sewer help, mail fraud, mail theft, identity theft. These are all topics that have a huge amount of subtopics underneath. They're very short, but they explain different kinds of scams, identity theft. This area right here is really good for talking about your senior family members or your children. I recommend if you have that and want to start the starting point, over here you see where to file a complaint. And I bring that up to you. Oh, look at that. It's right next to the zip code right here. Okay. File a complaint. That's for identity theft, mail, mail fraud, if you're a victim. Now, obviously, I want you to understand we cannot do everything for every person. What we try to do when we work a case is we look for the largest number of victims and we try to get that case prosecuted. But what I say to you is if you don't report it, no one knows. You could actually be part of a larger case, and because you think no one will do anything about it, you elect not to report it. I say, go the other way. You want to report it, not only to us, but also to your local police. Get a police report on file. Particularly if you're a victim of identity theft, you, anybody been a victim of identity theft? Okay, all right, I see one, yes. It is a nightmare, and you know that you need a police report to do anything with your banks or your credit cards. So, right here is the section we're dealing with. Now, I'm going to ask you to go, Jim, to financial crimes. From the financial crimes list, victims of financial crimes, and there's this line right here, Delivering Trust. Visit our website at Delivering Trust. Delivering Trust is a new website that the Postal Inspection Service has started specifically to provide information on um, scams and different kinds of frauds. We have public service announcements where we have gotten help from assistance from stars by Gone that are still out there. Jim, if you can show me the top of the page. Okay, I'm going to see. Does anybody recognize this woman? Yeah. Go down a little bit. Does anybody recognize this gentleman? That's Adam West. Remember Batman? Okay, so we had Batman and I Dream of Genie. They did some public, public ser uh, service announcements for us as a starting point to engage with seniors on. So I'd ask Jim if you can play me the... Hello? You can stop right there. I know I haven't won the Nodgy Nodgy foreign lottery, and I won't send you a thousand dollars to claim my prize. You dastardly villain. You're driving me batty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You told me to stop calling. 
<laughs> so I, I almost can guarantee that no one will forget that video when you leave here today. But there's several on there, and you can, they're very short, 30 second clips, but they get the message across. It's very memorable, and people associate to that. So what I'd like to do is, as you go on to the Delivery and Trust website, and Jimmy's there now, um, what I want to talk to you about next is this is a scam. This is the this is a, a part on the Delivery and Trust website um, underneath the PSA stuff. The tail of the cycle. Now inside of all your folders, you have part of a scam letter. It says, "Please keep in a safe place." But actually, after today, you could probably throw it away. I don't want to see anybody using this later on as part of a marketing campaign or anything like that. Don't get any ideas? This is a fraud. Right? This is Maria Duval. Maria Duval is a world-renowned psychic, supposedly. And these letters go out to the tune of about 58 million um, in a year. We, we try to shut them down, but it's it's a business. You got to understand that they run a very good business. About 1.7 million people respond to a letter like this, where they're asking for information, and they, what do they offer in return? They offer in return good fortune and good tidings, and how much money do you want to make, and I'll help you get all that by channeling all of the universe's positive energy towards you. So, one of the letters had this in the back. This is on the back page of the letter that you have in your hand. So what I'd ask you all to do is please take your right hand, and I'd ask you to put it over that hand on the back page. And I want you to keep your hand there for a whole seven seconds. Okay, now don't, don't take it off because we won't get a good reading. But once, once you've done that, now you can take that palm print that you have along with your $45 and send it to Mrs. Duval and she will send you a personalized psychic reading because now she's in touch with you. <laughs> and I say this because 1.7 people, 1.7 million people a year have done this. Now if you're in that if you're in the room, I don't want to embarrass you, I won't call you out, but it is a scam. We have a video here because this is actually a Philadelphia division case. This is an investigation that we are working, very proud of it, and I'd ask Jim to play the video. If you could be guaranteed good good fortune by purchasing one of these medallions for just $40, would you buy it? Well, millions of people did pay the $40 to the Destiny Research Center, and specifically psychic Maria Duval, after receiving a multi-page personalized solicitation. And Maria Duval is a world-renowned psychic, and she had a personalized specific premonition about it, some sort of a vision, and that uh, good fortune was going to come your way. But to realize that good fortune, recipients needed to make a small purchase of a medallion or talisman. Very, very cheap mass-produced trinkets from China and Hong Kong. And the purchase prices would be anywhere from 10 cents to $1.50 or less, and they were bought by the tens of thousands. Postal inspectors began to investigate after receiving complaints from victims. Then they filed an administrative action with the courts to cease Maria Duval's mail. You're looking at one month's worth of envelopes from victims of this scam, more than 30,000 pieces of mail. At about $40 a piece, that would be about $1.2 million that we have uh, saved for the victims. Uh, over the course of the year, that would be something in the neighborhood of $15 million. The letters did have a small note on the side stating, this solicitation is for promotional purposes only. It was almost impossible for me to read, and the elderly victims would receive this solicitation surely would have been unable to read. And most of the victims were elderly. Inspectors are urging consumers to be wary of any and all solicitations that arrive in the mail. 100,000 solicitations a week. It's hard to have a personal connection with 100,000 people each week. I think that surpasses any volume of Facebook friends you might have. <laughs>
that case is an ongoing investigation. We have stopped the mail, but we're actually going after the suspects. And this goes to what I said earlier about our global connections. The suspects on this case are in Europe and in Canada. So, not beyond our reach, but there are some international, I just can't go and get them. Um, small court with the legal system. If we go further down the page here, Jim, we've talked in this instance about how to protect seniors, but I also wanted to talk to you about what we have on the other end of the spectrum, which is younger people. And on the bottom of our Delivering Trust website is what we have. We have a, new, a show, a TV show, and it's called The Inspectors. The Inspectors show here in the Philadelphia area comes on Saturday mornings at 10.30 in the morning. It's a half hour show. Last year there were 22 episodes. All of the shows come from actual cases. The cases themselves are about identity theft, mail fraud, some about mail crimes, but predominantly about understanding the scams that are out there. As a postal inspector, I've dealt with all kinds of scams. I can look at something and tell you right away what the scam. If you're not in my line of work, you're not really sure. It could be true. You don't know. Most of us think we're pretty savvy. I run into a lot of savvy business people that are victims of business fraud. So what I offer this to you is a reference point on the inspectors. It's a consumer education. It follows a couple of inspectors as they fight the crime and educate viewers on how to protect themselves from identity theft, email scams, and other scams in the mail. It's a family-friendly scripted uh, crime scene series. So you're not going to see people pulling guns, you're not going to see people shooting anybody. It's about the message of prevention. The show encourages open communication and delivers positive messages about living with disabilities, overcoming challenges, and the power of perseverance. So I say this to you because if you haven't seen it, just go home, take 30 seconds, DVR it, take the time, look at it. If you find it interesting and you want to share it with your family, it's good family education is what we were looking for. But it's not for little kids. And I would recommend, don't try to do any of the scams that they portray there, because certain steps have been left out, you will fail. You will get caught. But that's something where we try to do it on the other end to protect consumers. So, as I finish today, what I'd like to leave, oh, I just wanted to mention, I'm sorry. That show was nominated for six Daytime Emmy Awards. So I, I thought that was significant. I didn't even know they had Daytime Emmys, but <laughs> six Daytime Emmy Awards. So it might be worth taking a, a little a look at that. Hopefully today I provide you some information about the inspection service, about what we do and what we do for the Postal Service and indirectly do for you as customers of the Postal Service. I'm hoping that you can take some of this information and use it for your own self, for the protection of your business, your own customers, and also for your family members. I would like to leave you with one last video that I'd like to show. I think it uh, explains what we do um, in sort of a funny way. Jim, if you can play that. Don't forget about us. Thanks for the sweater. You're welcome, sir. Hope she enjoys it. Okay, we're clear on the sweater. Let's pack it up. We've got to get the next package over to 14th Street. Let's move it, people. I know, right? They come with the stuff.
on behalf of the South Jersey District and the PCC, as well as Philadelphia, Central Pennsylvania, we want to say thank you for sharing that information with us and keeping you there safe. Thank you.